Great. Thank you guys for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who have registered for the great webinar from different countries and want to witness great session happening today. Hope you and your family are doing safe. Just to let you know that today is the first webinar for the new year from AI Core Spot for US region. And what a great topic to start the same. It's about how digital technology helps energy and utilities. And we are really excited to host this. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Naveen and I'll be your host for the day. I'm working as Vice President Innovation Strategy at AI Core Spot and have great experience around a couple of decades in the consulting firms dealing in and around the emerging technologies. Further, I've been joined by my colleague Arvin and Naveen who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to put them in such a hard work and making this one a huge success. We'll try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can gain maximum output out of the same. Let me provide a brief background to all of you about AI Core Spot. We started a couple of years back, backed up by InfoVision, who is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, who is our technology partner. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies. The focus is to provide all of you a deep dive in all the sectors, wherever technology is there. And every month we have a different theme. We are gaining momentum month on month. Our aim is to be number one AI driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be a part of the same in supporting, growing and making it a success. We'll enrich the content through a lot of mediums like podcasts, blogs, videos, digital content, newsletters to shed light on this ever evolving industry. The focus is to do industry backed webinars and hybrid events. The knowledge base will be made from reliable data through subject matter experts, industry leaders, thought leaders, and our partners in Forvision and Digit7. Today, we are having a lovely and unique webinar around the great theme, which combines the power of digital technologies and of how it helps energies and utilities sector. So if you want to know the role of digital technology in energy and utility sector and how it helps in transformation, role of automation solutions, simulation and planning tools, challenges which comes along with the same and so on, then you are in the right place. We'll try to go all over it throughout the panel discussion and give lots of insights to you. There are lots more in store for next month with focus on different technologies like AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, AR, VR, and digital twins. So request all of you to go through our website, which is aicorespot.io for future updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months to follow. Before starting with the day, I'd like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for the amazing learning and networking day. Special mention about our knowledge and innovation partner, InfoVision, who has supported us since beginning and provided us the right support to bring the community together. InfoVision is an end-to-end -end IT and business services provider, specializing in providing technology transformation and innovation projects for over 25 years across multiple industries and serve 12 global locations, including US, Latin America, Middle East, and India. They have unique state-of-the-art research and innovation lab named Digit7 in Richardson, Texas, with five great innovative products. So to get in touch with them, kindly log on to their website, which is infovision.com, and leave your details through the contact us section. Now, coming and come moving on and coming to our community partners for today, it includes nice source who came together to make this webinar a success. Special mention to attendees of the event who registered and came together to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, if you gain few things out of this or get to network with each other, then our core objective as a platform will be achieved. Further, if anybody wants to ask questions, they can type it in the Q&A section. You can type in as and when the panel member speaks and we'll try to get it answered as per the time permitted. Now, without wasting any time, let me hand over the stage to Datta, who is the Chief Business Officer handling energies and utilities at InfoVision, and who is the moderator for this panel discussion as well. He's joined by a couple of great leaders, Waiko, SVP, CIO, MySource, and Mike, VP of IT. So over to you, Datta, to begin this exciting panel discussion. Thank you very much, Nitin. Thanks, Arvind. Uh, thank you, Waiko, and then Mike. Um, very good morning to all of you. 
So, <clears throat> and also to all the um, our uh, audience who has joined. This is a great topic. And uh, as uh, Nitin mentioned, this is the first one in the year. So, happy new year to all of you. I know we are already two weeks into it. So, um, rapidly evolving information and then operational technology um, landscapes are driving digitization in all the industry sectors. So, energy and utility is no exception. Digital technologies are catalyzing the development of new business and operating models for existing players as well as the new entrants in the utility sector. This includes advanced analytics to improve operational efficiency and develop prospects for the new services. Emerging uh, utility trends also enable new performance improvements such as grid resilience, cutting maintenance time and costs with automated asset inspections and predictive maintenance. So in addition, digitization powered by the Internet of Things improves the visibility of distributed uh, utility assets, enhancing operations uh, transparency. This further provides the ability to identify opportunities for improvement and facilities for easy transition into low carbon utility solutions. See, there are more than 10,000 plus startups just within the space. Some of them are doing some significant work. And um, if you really see, um, there are a lot of buzzwords around asset connectivity, operational automation, artificial intelligence, decentralized utility, blockchain, digital twin, utility mapping, immersive technology, grid resilience, decarnation, et cetera, et cetera. So in order to help understand and discuss on some of these topics, we have um, a great uh, um, uh, panel of speakers. We have Vaco, Banks, and Mike Parr who have extensive experience in the field of energy and utilities, and they have been leading companies and practitioners, helping implement some of these technologies and in the middle of this revolution. We'll also deep dive into specific areas once we have introductions from them and get started. So Veiko, if you can introduce yourself and then uh, your company, two minutes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Started. Thank you. And you can hear me okay? No audio issues? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity here. Uh, again, my name is Waco Banks, and I'm the uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for NISource. I uh, started with the company September 1, so I'm just now coming up on that six-month uh, mark with the company. But just a little bit about me. I started in the uh, utilities uh, telephony business with a company called uh, Century Link. Uh, it was Century Telephone back in the 90s, late 80s, 90s. Uh, Century Tel, it was rebranded, then Century Link. And then now it has recently been rebranded to Lumen Technology. So I spent 16 years there really uh, a lot of work with merger and acquisition, more on the system side, integration of systems, processes, business processes, and transformations uh, at the time, automation, which you could refer to part of that as a digital uh, transformation experience. Uh, left CenturyLink in 2010, uh, late 2010, started with uh, STP Nuclear Operating Company in 2011. So that was uh, uh, generation, uh, electric generation, uh, nuclear power, zero carbon, I might add, and uh, was there for about 11 years, uh, maybe 12 years, uh, leading their uh, technology transformation as well as some other functions. Uh, before I left, I was also in charge of uh, or had a, a period of time responsible for human resources and really all the shared services. And then uh, now I'm here in uh, based in downtown uh, Columbus, Ohio with NISource. Uh, I'm uh, loving the job. It's a, a, a lot of challenges and opportunities we have with digital transformation and uh, modernizing our systems. But uh, 
uh, excited to be here. We have about 7,500 employees uh, with the company. Uh, we serve about 4 million customers, primarily gas and transmission of gas customers around a half a, a well, around 500,000 on the electric side and growing. And uh, proud to say, just a plug, we just were named, NYSource was named to the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and then uh, uh, recognized on Newsweek as uh, most one of the most responsible companies for 2023. So great organization and uh, proud to be here and look forward to this uh, dialogue with you guys. Thank you, uh, Rico. Mike? Hi, everybody. Uh, first off, thank you for the opportunity to, to come to this webinar and, and talk about IT. I'm, I'm extremely passionate about technology and uh, the transformations and so forth. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I was a, in the Navy for 20 years and, and the latter part of my Navy, we transformed how the Navy did business. And how we did that was through technology, uh, specifically the VR, the AR, how we trained, how did we uh, get forces ready to deploy and so forth, saving money, saving uh, carbon footprint, and et cetera. Uh, went over to Whirlpool, where I was there for the transformation, again, a digital transformation of how we did business. Um, and really seeing that IoT uh, spectrum of having connected appliances, connecting to the grid, seeing how that affects. And it's amazing when you start uh, following the breadcrumb of energy through the systems of what is affected and how you as a consumer all the way through an engineer to the manufacturer, how you can generate um, savings and both energy and, and again, the carbon, because that is the big driver these days is, is renewables and, and carbon footprint. Uh, most recently, I was over at Scope Services. Scope Services provides uh, project management, staffing, and IT solutions to utility companies. Um, lots of experience there from everything from installing the uh, smart grids through uh, helping out utility companies do that technology transformation and, and helping them see uh, the world a little bit different and collect data and be able to uh, plug into the renewable and the, the consumer faced um, everything from EV chargers to batteries, to backups and so forth, all through a digital transformation framework. So again, I, I appreciate the opportunity here to have this conversation. Thank you very much, Mike. So let's get started. So I just want to give a very quick glimpse into the recent survey which was done in 2022 in terms of the top 10 utility trends. So um, if you really see by the percentage uh, based on the survey, asset connectivity is 19%, followed by operational automation was 14%, then artificial intelligence 12%, Decentralized utility 11% and blockchain 11%, all others fall below the 10% mark. So, uh, Veiko, first question to you from your perspective and uh, seeing from your company uh, as well you see, as you are leading some of this, what are the drivers for the digital transformation um, in the utility sector? And um, uh, if you can throw some light based on your prior experience within the nuclear space from the energy sector as well. You're on mute, I think, uh, Veiko. Sorry about that. I muted because I'm right downtown and there's sirens and I don't want people to think anyone's coming <laughs> for me. <laughs> but, but, uh, to, to your question, uh, unfortunately, what I've seen is organizations are have to experience quite a bit of pain, and then they are reacting. They re are reacting to that pain with digital transformation. I hate to say this because I love. I actually do like Southwest, and uh, I'm about to get on a Southwest flight. But uh, with the Southwest debacle, the meltdown. You can look at that there, uh, you know, what happened. They are now 
in PR, you know, uh, mode. They're having to recover from this, from the meltdown. And now, you know, I, I saw in the news where they're going to be spending upwards of a billion dollars in additional investments on top of what they've been spending to uh, uh, right the wrong with customers, etc. Um, well, why do that? Well, why not look at it from a proactive perspective? I look at digital transformation like the roof on your house. You have to maintain these things. You have to change out the roof. And you want to do that before uh, it runs to failure. And so unfortunately, I think some of the drivers are pain. Think of the pandemic. Um, it's cliche now, but you know, who would have said everyone work from home and organizations can be better, as good or better performing than they were prior to the pandemic? Well, the, it took a pandemic to thrust everyone into something that they were forced to do. Why not be comfortable with taking some risk, uh, learning from failure, appreciating and respecting failure, and uh, being more proactive with digital transformation. So I'm an advocate of not waiting on the pain is uh, engaging in, in digital transformation more as a preventative measure to make sure you're competitive in the future instead of waiting and, and really driving, you know, that quarter to quarter uh, results, ha having that long view. Uh, the other thing that's driving it, I think, is customer demands are changing. Um, I know I have four children. No, one of the oldest is 18. The way he engages with the marketplace today is vastly different than the way his eight-year-old sister engages with it. And it's very different from the way that I engage with it. Uh, and then uh, certainly our parents and grandparents. Um, so again, I think rather than waiting on the change and then reacting to it, we have to change the way we're doing things digitally, uh, prophylactically, so that we're ahead of the ball and not behind it. And then the other is uh, there's tremendous cost synergies and savings to be driven out of organizations. Of course, you got the top line uh, to deal with, but the cost savings are enormous, I believe, if you, if you have organizations preventatively uh, going through these digital transformations uh because in doing that you're automating processes while you don't want to automate a bad process so you're redesigning the business processes and so on and so forth so those are just some of the things i think that are driving transformation but i think we need to start looking as leaders in this in these industries as looking at it more preventatively and getting ahead of it and not waiting on uh you know disasters Thank you, Vico. So, Mike, um, <clears throat> from the point of view of, I would like to definitely get uh, your perspective on the same. But if you really see the landscape has changed. Oh, from... absolutely. Absolutely. I, and Waco actually hit on a couple points that I think are, are critical that I would love to expound upon. Speed. Uh, so Waco mentioned the customer service and, and how they approach life and stuff like that. The acceptance of the 1940s, if the grid goes down and we're down for, you know, three or four days, the generation that was accepted that. Um, today, if it's down for three or four seconds, you're calling customer service and saying, hey, what the heck? Um, so there has to be a speed uh, that's actually beyond the human capability of responding. So that's where an AI and machine learning comes into play and, and so forth. How do we integrate that into our, our smartness of our, our service to our customers? Be it all the way from the, how do we make our generation of electricity or power or, and so forth um, efficient and quick uh, to being able to respond to crisis when it comes? Uh, basically to serve that customer service. The other one is the, is the population growth. Um, back in the 40s, the population was half of what it is today. Uh, now we're talking about a population center. So you now have 
we are now beyond the capabilities of rolling a truck to everybody's house uh, to support them. So again, how do we overlay technology that's that's there to actually help with the efficiency of being able to support? The third area is renewables. Um, like it or not, renewables is coming. Um, how do we how do we integrate that in? How do we how do we make a seamless transition between a wind generation, solar, uh, fossil fuel, nuclear? uh hydro power source so that we can make each one complementary to each other instead of having a situation like houston last year where you know the wind farms froze and and now you bring it on you have to make that complementary again beyond the where we have quickly and overcome the capabilities of human um to respond and transfer power quickly across the the board and the last one is technology growth. So how do we support everything I just said? Technology has grown to the point where we now have the capabilities through a couple uh, strikes on the keyboard to be able to build a solid artificial intelligence that's not going to take over the world. That's the next question. Um, but an artificial intelligence and a machine learning that can actually uh complement supplement the human being manager uh to be able to support our customers on the uh, that are the ultimate goal but more importantly how do we make our business more efficient cost effective etc by utilizing technology um in the forefront i, I if so, i could uh sure go ahead Dr. Michael. Just add to one thing Mike said to this question, when he mentioned technology and the growth of technology, when I think about organizations that are on this digital transformational journey, uh, when you look at the, the current state systems, there's often a lot of disparate 1990s technology, you know, mainframe, you name it. That makes it very difficult to recruit and retain, and I emphasize retain talent. I mentioned I have an 18 year old who's majoring in computer science. Um, he's already looking for companies to work for, and he's very selective. What are the technologies that they employ because he gets to choose the technology he works on with you know, X, Y, or Z company? So that's another interesting thing that often doesn't come up is digital transformation driving the improvement of recruiting and retaining top talent. And then when you can recruit and retain top talent, that drives your costs down as well. So I thought I just wanted to add that on. It's something that uh, has come to the forefront on my radar uh, that traditionally with digital transformation, you might not think about. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a very good point. So I would like to draw the attention to the last year or just around a year back, what happened in Dallas when everything froze and almost three to four days, there was no power. Even with all these advancements, the um, basically the test to whatever we have implemented comes when there is basically a demand when there is a natural disaster, right, like that. Do you think actually we have learned from that? And is there any advancement or uh, basically uh, to improvise and also to accelerate, uh, you think, from the utilities side based on those learnings? So if, if I may, yes, I think we've learned from it. Have we taken action, though? So back to the complementary energy uh, sources. So, and you see this in you see this in Germany right now with the Ukraine crisis, um, where they went wholesale into renewables, and their backup was power or sources provided by Russia. And you see the crisis, and you see the concern, the big concern they have right now with entering into the cold season. 
you have we have to we learned that there are limitations to each one of the energy sources where i hope we take the next step and and waco actually he he almost stole one of my jokes that i normally tell about utilities they're stuck in the 90s and only a small percentage of the time it's the 1990s sometimes they're stuck on the clay tablets and chisels um we need to go to that next level we need to take a step back and say okay hey what does logic demand and a logic demands that we have a complementary um power source or power grid that utilizes so that we avoid the houston's we avoid a single source um reliance and that's where if you look across all industries um nobody relies most people the 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 successful people do not rely on a single source of input so we need to learn from the utility companies taking the lessons and and waco hit on it great we learned from crisis um we learned a lot from the pandemic we learned a lot from the, the energy uh learned a lot from the ukraine war and so forth let's apply and that's where i think technology and this digital transformation can really help out accelerate that learning and application of what we've learned thanks mike yeah um, go ahead uh, do you want to add my vehicle? yeah I'll, I'll just add uh interesting you ask about uh, uh, dallas really i think you're referring to the texas ERCOT grid issue right uh, at the time, I was with STP Nuclear, and actually one of our uh, units uh, went offline uh, due to, to the cold. Um, not that nuclear power can't withstand that. It was actually, if, if you understand nuclear power generation, there are thousands of safety components. It's, in my view, one of the very safer energy production uh, methodologies in the world with zero carbon footprint. but uh, with that comes tremendous amounts of safety features around those uh, units, and any little thing will put it into a safe condition, and that's the way they're designed. And uh, there was a at STP a, a, a com simple component that that froze up and triggered the safety functions and and brought it down, and uh, contributed you know to the issues where ERCOT was unable to manage the demand supply. And got into a bind there. Have has Texas learned from that? I think absolutely uh, they've learned from it. Uh, I know I can speak, you know, from an STP nuclear operating perspective. Um, a lot of uh, critiquing lessons learned, uh, visits from ERCOT. There's now audits that ERCOT performs. So I think both ERCOT and the generating facilities in the state. Uh, learned a lot and not only learned, I think for a lesson to be learned, it has to be employed and, and, and going forward and they've done that. So very confident that in the future, these black swan events that once in a, you know, two decade, three decade period, these things occur, uh, we've gotten better and better. What I will say though, is I think that our uh, politicians and legislators, um, there's I'll, I'll say it like this. I think there's more education to be done on the importance of protecting and uh, creating reliable power grids uh, throughout the uh, nation. Uh, but uh, just to add on, I totally agree with uh, Mike's comments as well. Thank you. See, uh, <clears throat> when it comes to this, as you mentioned, actually, you were 18 year old. See, the new generation is changing. They are seeing the advancements in the retail with the way Instacart works or Amazon works and then how they keep them informed of what is going on or seeing basically movies on the Netflix with just actually one touch of a button. So whenever these disasters happen, the first thing is to actually keep the customers in mind and then keep them updated on what is going on. And the technology is there. Is it being utilized? And basically the changes are being made instead of people calling they should be doing a push rather than a pull so that they also actually not overwhelming the call centers at that particular point in time what's your basically views on that both mike and then uh, the, this is a this is a good topic and it it is crossed industry 
is how do we focus on the the consumer and in the good old days when i was growing up it was always the customer's right customers are number one then somewhere and i'm not i'm not trying to accuse anybody or anything like that so please forgive me um somewhere in between about the early 90s to now we've swapped our view and we said the customer is an annoyance it's all about us it's all about the business we gotta get you hit it you hit it right on the cue data we need to switch, switch that around. We have to focus on the customer. We have to have a push. We have to have an automated system. And there are automated, if you, if you can't tell, I'm a little passionate about this one. This is where there are, again, technology can drive. There are systems out there like AWS Connect. There's, a, there's uh, uh, Analytics 8. There are several other companies out there that their sole purpose is to turn around that call where, hey, I have a flag that pops up. I'm automatically going to send out an SMS text to my customer base that says, hey, this is down. This is basically answering the question, who, what, where, why, when, and how, and when it's coming back. We need, as a utility uh, service provider for our consumers, we need that now. And technology is the technology is readily available today. Um, we need to drive that. We need to get out of the how do I work my bottom line and remember that our bottom line is really driven by our customer satisfaction, our, our five star rate. People come to a people review a company by their rate, not by you know, they're bought, nobody looks at the, the Dow Jones. Everybody looks at the five-star rate. So we have to remember that's where you need to drive. And that's how you need to use technology to provide your customer that service that you're, you hit it on the head, that service that they demand and they want and they need, and we need to provide it. Sorry, I was got a little passionate. <laughs> no, that's that's great. Um, I would just add that uh, at NYSource, that's something that I think we do uh, fairly well. Certainly, there's always room for improvement, but uh, is staying out in front of incidents, uh, notifying customers proactively of what's going on. Uh, why is there a, 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 a crew down the street working on the, the thing? And then and then if they don't see a message of, of what's going on in the neighborhood, that drives calls to customer service. I think another challenge we have across utilities in general is you have right now a generation of folks. I have my grandmother that's still living. I have my uh, parents. I have you know my age a group of individuals. Then you have folks like my son that are enter entering the workforce they all want to use all of the channels the traditional calling in and talking to someone you contrast that to the 18 year old he absolutely doesn't he doesn't want to talk to me <laughs> um, i'll text him uh to call me and he says what do you want just text me um but but that's the way they want to interact with the organizations it's um more of that uh quick hit drive by uh in, including from paying bills to hearing about what's going on why is why is my why are my lights flickering or off right now um they don't want to talk to anyone uh but they do want to be in the loop and kept notified with various channels i think in the future that's talking about digital transformation it will change from that analog i want to talk to somebody on the phone to uh you know, call center reps, I can see it being, you know, decades in the future, it, it will not be calls, it'll be more of e-channels. Uh, what are the channels of communication that, that individuals uh, strive to use? And then we have to meet that demand. And again, rather than reacting to it, we have to balance that as we go along uh, the way and generations of people and, and customers demands change. But absolutely agree, critical that uh, customers are the lifeblood of our firm, and uh, we have to keep them in the loop. And I think we do a good job of that, certainly areas for improvement. And when we integrate and digitally transform those back-end systems, it makes it even easier 
and uh, timelier on those communications to customers. I just would like to touch upon one more small um, uh, aspect. See, so far we were having uh, mega uh, power producers, but the or once actually the renewable energy has come into picture, the microgrids are changing the game. Each and every individual, including you and then me, are basically power generation sources now. So in terms of adapting to that, is the industry really geared up in a, uh, to leverage that as well as to basically help balance the power requirements? Uh, in a more predictive way. So we actually at, at Scope Services, we are working with a company out of Baltimore to, that actually is really relevant here. Basically what it is, is it, there's an island in the Baltimore area that Baltimore actually paid for a battery storage backup for each one of the houses on this island. There's about a hundred houses. And basically the purpose of that was in the event that the grid was overloaded, they could take this island completely off and ship them to the battery storage. Um, so they become their own micro grid. Uh, other areas, Florida is working on something sim very similar to this and so forth. So yes, you have a lot of micro, um, but this is, again, this is where technology can really help. And this in, in Baltimore specifically, this is, this is what, they're doing is they're monitoring the usage. When it gets to a certain point, they start looking at, okay, how do I shift off people and so forth? So they're using data and actual analytics to drive when they can shift them to the battery backup and when they need to shift them back and so forth. So again, technology can drive that so that you can take all these isolated microgrids uh, because I think that is where you have people, I mean, there's three houses within my visibility right now that have solar panels on their, on their roof. Uh, Whirlpool Corporation actually put a wind farm up and their entire, uh, the second largest uh, man, uh, appliance manufacturing plant is completely wind farm. Well, how does that little microgrid help out the power source? Well, again, utilizing data, you can see, okay, when do, when are they peaked? When can I ship them over and, and so forth like that. You also see this out in California right now where they have a solar grid um, area, they have wind farms, and then they have fossil fuel. Well, what they're trying to figure out is, right now is after the sun goes down, the solar grid has a battery storage how do I bleed that down effectively so that the next day I'm not wasting energy? Because right now, California is dumping a lot of energy um, because the grid goes down. They don't have enough battery backup to do that and, and so forth. So again, technology, the data, the, the digital side of it, how do you drive that equilibrium of power usage across the grid or the microgrids and into yeah. the grid? And speaking of game changers, you mentioned storage. Uh battery storage you know is coming along and uh if you think back 10 years ago where battery storage was you look at it today you might say not a, a tremendous amount of you know improvement but it's coming it and and when that occurs that is a game changer uh especially for uh deregulated markets like i mentioned uh ERCOT. uh so uh just echo what mike said nothing i won't repeat anything but uh i think storage and, and uh renewables microgrids um all are very uh, good for zero carbon footprints for the environment but has to be balanced with some of that baseload generation so one interesting uh, question i'll throw here i am not wearing my technology hat or a uh a chief business officer hat here as a, a person uh, who is also a consumer. See, at the end of all these things, all these fancy things of digitization, modernization, and then cutting a technology, at least I should see some at least dip in my utility bill. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? I don't see at least I haven't seen anything happening so far. 
<laughs> so from my perspective, and this actually answers one of the sort of answers one of the questions that was on the is, has been asked is yes, if I make things more efficient and I can you know adjust the with technology and so forth and I can reduce the number of truck rolls and stuff like that, I should see the savings. The problem is we have a extremely aging power infrastructure infrastructure extremely aging um that needs to be replaced it's not that technology cost technology costs money don't don't get me wrong an it person costs more than a field technician um that's just but we have to replace and there's going there has to be a balance there and i do not work for a infrastructure replacement company but I do know that they cost a lot of money. Um, that and it, and this is a global problem. This is not just a isolated to the United States. Canada has the same problem. I we were working on a or uh, talking about a project up there uh, to replace their infrastructure. If you look at some of the third world countries uh, like Africa, they have no infrastructure, so you have to build. Again, it's not answering the question of hey, why is my bill not going down? but it's giving a pseudo insight as to why the utility company is not lowering your your bill. Nico, do you have any No, I, I I tend to agree it's the it's the infrastructure uh it's uh in many cases, you know, I I'm uh responsible for technology. The technology is the same way, the same position. It's uh it's been run to end of life over the past several decades, along with the physical infrastructure that that exists, uh, TND and that sort of thing, uh, but the internal capacity of some of these systems I mentioned, mainframe and COBOL, you know, uh, for those uh, techies that are on the are listening. But uh, we have to also they're, they're at end of life, and with within a world of cybersecurity, you have to make sure you have modern systems and all of that costs uh, uh, quite a bit unfortunately and so that that also drives it and then you've got the cost of uh, source fuel right you've got uh, oil and gas and uh, we talked about nuclear there you have to load the reactor with fuel uh, those fabrication costs have not gone down at all and uh, so, so all of these coming things coming together does put price pressure uh, you know uh, on on bills, for instance, including uh, inflationary numbers. Thank you. So I think um, in terms of the um, the areas are basically the drivers for the digital transformation. I think we all are in a kind of an agreement, and then we hit some of the um, key areas. I would like to spend at least a couple of minutes on. Yes, there is technology. We have seen that actually in retail. We have seen that in uh, telecom, um, including actually the greatest things like metaverse is coming where it is totally in the virtual world. So what is the barrier in terms of implementing this? Why are we lagging? We'll take so, a couple of minutes to actually discuss. Yeah, uh, Mike. Yeah, it's, it's the barriers are the unknown. Um, can when I push that magic button to have my artificial intelligence running my system, can I trust that? Because at the end of the day, artificial intelligence is is the same garbage in equals garbage out. If you if you program your, it's just a computer. It's just a bunch of zeros and ones. If you put the wrong zeros and ones in, hey. Um, and I've been living with this dream for over two decades um the trust of ai the unknown of technology and so forth um one the second one and this addresses uh another one of the questions is right now utilities are as we kind of joked about they're they're a, the the infrastructure is aging but also the workforce is aging you have a lot of people that are um and one of my peers he was talking about he is about to go through the great retirement 
uh, for the area because everybody in his in his group the average age is 58 and above so they're all getting ready to retire okay so how do i replace that with the young talent well, the young talent's coming in with the energy to apply all this technology, but they have no knowledge of what the utility is doing. So, yeah, you can put a bunch of zeros and ones with your C sharps and dot nets and you know and so forth in there, but if it if it's not solving the problem, um, the other one is immaturity. Uh, and what I mean by this is. I can I can put a bunch of technology into a 1956 uh, car, but it still doesn't make that 1956 car be any more efficient. It doesn't the gas. It's still six miles per gallon, and and so forth. Um, and then the last one is data. Uh, I'm I'm very data driven. There, but we are inundated with data every day there's there's trillions and trillions of data points that are generated on a daily basis what is important what how do i how do i glean from what my washer and dryer are generating into an energy sector um and so forth so the moral of the story is we need to get the smart people integrated with the the legacy people to figure out what's important, how do we get efficient? Start start taking bites out of the elephant instead of trying to eat the entire elephant at one time. If that if that answers the question. No, yeah, partially, but still, I think the real critical areas like even healthcare and life sciences, where lives are actually involved, technology is being embraced. Utilities is not really that critical if you really see. I know actually power is required. Yeah, absolutely. But the companies were making actually the profits. There is there a sufficient apportioning of the money or is it really the budget pressure? Nobody wants to spend money on the technology innovation. That's my question. So I think, uh, Vaiko, you can. Yeah, I think uh, you probably hit it spot on uh, when you compare contrast to the healthcare industry. In fact, I had a, a note here that I, I put down here around, uh, you know, human beings are addicted to certainty, comfort, predictability, all of those things. And when you're running a business, often we're you know, really uh, focused in like a laser beam on the quarter to quarter earnings. And we really have to be focused. Yes, we have to deliver on the short term results, but we also have to have the view of the long term. And, you know, as I tell my teams, we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Change is the only constant. If you don't like growth and development, meaning you, you don't like to be comfortable you may not be that successful in this industry we've got to get very comfortable being uncomfortable and uh when you think about digital transformation that isn't certain it's not predictable uh and it's often not comfortable it's i mean it's hard stuff and so i think that's part of what's driving it is that short-term focus versus having organizations have that longer view. Um, again, I hate to pick on someone when they're down, but it's just, it's, it's uh, front of mind is, you know, the airline industry. I'm sure that other airlines are in the same position as Southwest. Southwest just happened to get bitten uh, by this, but, you know, not investing properly in, in the infrastructure uh, preventatively. Well, why not? Well, they're probably focused on hitting numbers. Their systems are working. IT is one of the, you know, technology is one of those things where it's a no, never mind until it's not working. So I think we, again, I go back to the opening comments of we can't wait on the pain points to thrust us into a, a mindset of uh, change and innovation and digital transformation. Uh, and we have to we have to stay away from that status quo thinking and status quo mindset 
and put ourselves in the uh, discomfort zone because that's where growth occurs. It's not going to occur when there's smooth sailing. And often we may have to manufacture that uh, burning platform to propel ourselves into the digital transformation space and not wait on something to force us into it. So I think you hit on it with, with budgetary uh, focus and concern and hitting numbers can sometimes hold people back from or organizations back from really investing in core uh, technologies and digital transformation. And if I may add, the sure. the mindset of it, if it ain't broke, do I have to fix it? And and Dada, you you had mentioned, hey, why is my electricity bill going down? And this is a perfect case, and you hit it. It, it costs. A field technician goes for $17 an hour. An IT specialist goes for $50 an hour. A data scientist goes for $120 an hour. That's going to affect your, your overall bill. Will I perform more efficiently and so forth? Yeah, but the consumer is sitting there going, well, why is my bill going up? I'm still, my house is still lit. I, I don't see the problem that you just, you're trying to fix. Which again, this is where a marketing scheme, a PR scheme has to be placed because Waco hit it on the head. All it takes is one, oh shoot, and the grid goes down in the Northeast and we are going to be scrambling for, you know, days. And, and perfect example here is if you remember Y2K, how many IT hours were spent to prevent Y2K from going. And on January 1st of 2001, everybody's like, oh, it was a non-player. Well, they didn't take into factor that the, the hours and hours and hours and hours and months and months of work that went into ensuring that on January 1, eh, and the utilities are affected by the same thing. And they're affected from the the, the top level all the way down, not, a, not insulting anybody up up on the executive levels, but at the end of the day, IT is a cost center. A IT technician does not turn a screwdriver. A field technician does. So I'm going to focus on the field technicians who are the ones that are actually turning the screwdriver and earning me money. The, the I, I, other thing, go ahead, Doctor. The I, other I, thing, the other thing, in addition to money, you meant we mentioned money and other drivers or barriers to these things. Um, the other is risk. Organizations and boards, their, their jobs are to manage risk and mitigate risk, right? Well, when you think of digital transformation and failing fast and those sorts of uh, cliche you know, phrases, uh, it doesn't marry up well with we've got to mitigate risk because embarking on these journeys of digital transformation, which I believe are absolutely required, it requires uh, an organization having the stomach for change and with change it can be disruptive and so i think that's another uh, driver there in addition to cost is 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 that risk profile i tend to agree at least to some extent but i tend to disagree too for example if we are trying to drive a car and if the car is becoming totally automated you should be even more shit scared than basically having automate basically the utilities. That is one. Second thing is, if you really see the cost of the resources within the utility sector, the apportioning of the budget, if you're trying to automate it, it's available 24 by seven, 365 days a year, rather than actually you're going shift by shift into the manpower. So those technologies are available, robots are available, Everybody else is leveraging. So I think there is some thought and then basically a basic mindset has to change. But there are a lot of new emerging companies, the startups which are coming. So one question I would like to ask before moving to the next uh, session is, I know actually you have outdated world uh, assets and then the technologies. Is there a way, and it is difficult to basically do keep on patching because you need to do a leapfrog jump sometimes in order to basically get there. Is there a 
uh, thinking to just uh, take over these some of these new companies which are totally actually uh, cutting edge and green, and then just start migrating towards that rather than just start to build up and then keep patching this, which is going to take a long time. Just one minute from each one of you, if you, if you. Yeah. May. I don't think that that is a good approach. I agree with you. It's it, we should not be at this point um, band-aiding uh, '90s, late '80s technology. Um, we we really need to take the bull by the horns, as they say, and uh, move ourselves into out of our comfort zones. We have to have the stomach for change. We have to adjust our risk profiles to make sure that we have modernized, integrated systems in place uh, for the next several decades to meet these demands with customers, for instance, that we've talked about. So uh, I think that was 30 seconds, but that that's uh, where I'm at on that. I'm I'm a little bit on the other side. I I understand where you're coming from that you need to have these high energy innovative companies come in and and work collaboratively with an ongoing project and the reason why i say that is that ongoing project how many utility companies out there cannot identify where all their assets are and i mean we have 811 don't dig before you call us for a reason they just simply don't know and i was talking with one utility company and they're like, well, we dug in this spot expecting to find this, and we found three other uh, 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 elements that we weren't expecting. So, yes, there's a legacy that we need to, the technology legacy that we need to keep going because at the end of the day, if that customer experiences a burp in their, in their service, you're done. Um, we need to innovate it. And and data, you you brought up a perfect point with the cars, and I'll, I'll try to be fast. How did the cars go from a 1956 cruiser to a Tesla? They incrementally increase the technology. They they their marketing and their PR campaign was outstanding. You first got an onboard navigation system, then you got an automated or automated route. Uh, then you got automated parking. Then you got automated this, automated that. And people became accustomed with that the that feature. And they did not charge more for it. And they did not charge more for it. Now, all of a sudden, you have automated driving cars where people are like, well, shoot, it, auto, it parks in New York City. Why? It's going to drive down this thing. And I can do the commercial where the guy's clapping while he's driving down the road. They Their marketing strategy was awesome. We have to do that instead of going to the consumer. We have to have that same marketing strategy to the the execs of the utility company saying, hey, this is what technology can do for you and build that trust in the utility. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> so we'll quickly move to the, I think in the interest of time, we have another 12 minutes. So um, how do you think the uh technologies like augmented reality virtual reality uh, we touched upon a bit on the AIML, um and also the internet of things um is there basically a good embracement of these technologies and then um adapting to what other industries are doing and then we are leveraging that are you seeing enough of it waco you want to go i know you have a, a hard stop here no, go ahead, and then I think what I'll do is I'll, I have a question that I see is directed at me, uh, 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 Data, and then I'll probably have to exit. But go ahead, Mike, on the AR, and then I'll hit on the question here to me, and if that's okay, Data. So, uh, Data, the, this answers your why is my electricity bill not going down. The AR, VR, uh, IoT can all help with that. Um, I'm going to go back to my Whirlpool days. If I have a connected appliance that I can have a digital clone of, and you have an error in that that issue, I can look at your digital clone, figure out what the error is, and I'm rolling one truck. 
Same thing for the for the utility companies. If I have an, a problem in the grid, I have a digital clone, I can isolate down based on connected IoT spectrum. I can isolate down where the area is instead of having somebody have to go out there and chase a line. Um, in the military, it was always a, okay, somebody go walk the, the fence line, see where the cut in the line is, and then we'll go fix it. Well, if I have it connected, I can isolate right down into at least the general area and oh, by the way, I have the parts pieces and, and procedures in place that I can do it quickly. So I can reduce that number. The other one with VR is the training, the training spectrum. It takes on average about a week, week and a half to train somebody to go out to replace a gas meter. Well, if I can put them in a classroom and put a VR headset on, on with them and actually walk them through the process, I might be able to shrink that time, that wasted uh, cost down to a period of time where I'm actually saving money. So now I'm saving the overall process. Um, and then we talked about AI and machine learning, but how do I complement the human being? And, and I stress complement, not replace, complement the human being to be more efficient, to be more quick to respond to the crisis, be more, be quicker to respond to energy management and so forth. So I think there is definitely a place in across the spectrum uh, in the utility marketing for all of these, from the training to the customer to the to the technician that's out on the field. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Veko. So there is a question definitely for you. Uh, how do you drive IT transformation when oftentimes IT is too uh, focused on legacy, immediate priorities, and siloed projects? That is one. I'll read out the just the other two also, just if that helps. How are utility uh, companies uh, preparing for the effects of climate change on their operations and infrastructure? And the third one is, as technology is changing rapidly, how leaders like Vaco and uh, uh, Michael will address the skills gap for their organization and keep up with the momentum? Yeah, I'll quickly uh, touch on the uh, how do you drive IT transformation when at times IT is focused on other priorities is the way I read this one. And then the uh, latter, as it's changing, technology is changing rapidly, how do leaders address the skills gap? I'll start with the last one. The, the, the skills gap, I believe embracing digital transformation is in and of itself helping to address the skills gaps because the talent coming out of your uh, even trade schools and universities is they're coming out of the out of the gate expecting that these organizations have these technologies and systems with which to work that they were trained on you know AI ML for instance so I think in, an organization that embraces digital transformation leans into that a little more risky profile or unknown uncertainty um, will help drive that and address the, the skills gap. Um, our universities are training uh, talent now on the newer technologies. On the uh, how do you focus an organization on transformation when you, you do have to deal with the old, antiquated processes, mainframe systems, production issues? Um, my view on that is, and it, there's several you know, views and models on this, but uh, one that, that we're employing is, uh, you know, carving out teams that are just focused on that uh, production support. Uh, we call that run versus build. And so we have dedicated teams just on the legacy front, uh, some of it augmented with consultants, some of it augmented with outsourced resources, and then you have build and we have fo uh, teams focused just on build. But what I think will not work is where you have one group of individuals trying to focus on that transformational journey while they're having to be distracted with these other issues. So uh, that's one uh, good example I could give on how do you, you drive that transformation when IT is focused on legacy. You have to carve it out. You have to make transformation a priority, and you have to make production stability uh, an equal priority. But uh, I really appreciate you guys letting me join the party here. 
I hope it's uh, been productive and uh, want to keep in touch. And uh, if there are other questions, I can answer those. Uh, you guys tell me how offline and uh, I'll be glad to answer and give opinions. I'm full of opinion, um, but I really appreciate it. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to end so I'm not uh, missing my flight here. But Mike, it's a pleasure. And uh, thanks, guys. Travel. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So if, if I could jump on the, the legacy, um, I agree everything Waco said, uh, but there's one key word that I think needs to be said, and that is no. Um, how many times have you gone to the, somebody has asked, hey, I need to update that mainframe. No, it's stable. It's, it's at a level. We have to transform. Now, I, I do understand and I appreciate that some things have to change and, and so forth, but no should be in the vocabulary. Um, and, and that technical debt is very, very difficult to get over. But that goes to the last question of how do I attract talent? If they come in and they say, oh, well, you're going to be working in um, Fortran and you have a mainframe and your 18 year old kid or your 22 year old kids want to say, well, I'm going to go over work for Apple. Uh, all right. Well, the challenge to them is, okay, here is my problem. Here's my tech technical debt that I have to get. That's not your problem, but I need you to mirror that in a new technology and give them the reins, give them the opportunity to grow, give them that opportunity to, to take it and run, uh, challenge them. Because a lot of the mainframe stuff is really fundamental. Um, it can be overcome. But you challenge the, the new guys to say, hey, I want you to make this better. And I, make, I want you to make this the next uh, Angry Birds application that somebody can use to, to manage utilities. Um, the question about climate change and uh, for the operations and infrastructure. Uh, there was the the question is how utilities companies preparing for the effects of climate change on their operations and infrastructure there's a picture that somebody shared with me once and it was a utility company went into a village in africa and i can't remember what it was but they had a lot of solar panels and they gave everybody a solar panel period they didn't give them um, how to connect it. They didn't give them the battery backup or anything like that. So the picture is somebody, uh, a village was using the solar panel as a table. Um, so the, the, the point of that story is we have to, even though we have renewables and, and uh, climate change and so forth uh, occurring and so forth, we have to focus on our infrastructure. I cannot emphasize enough how much of the infrastructure is is at a risk right now and it, it grows every day um we have to focus on that because at the end of the day regardless of where the energy source is coming from it has to go across the grid and if that grid cannot support it because of population growth because of aging because of uh, uh distribution and so forth it has to be addressed it has to be uh focused now with that said a lot of major uh, utility manufacturers are focusing on renewables and focusing on their, their challenge and their people. Um, anything from 2030 to 2035 are the typical, hey, I want to go, I want to cut my carbon emissions by 50%. Uh, 2050 is thrown out with a, I want to be carbon neutral and so forth. My skeptical and, and don't yell at me is we, again, we have to have a collect, a, collaborative effort between the energy sources i i think it needs to be a graph like this where this is fossil fuels it has to we have to work our way off of fossil fuels make, by making them more efficient uh reduction in use and so forth while we are building the the renewables because if we if we do a stair step we're not going to do that we're going to have more houston events we're going to have more germany events and stuff like that where people are going to at the end of the day, people are going to die because we try to jump off the cliff way too quickly. We have to be logical about this. And that's where I think technology really can come into play. This digital transformation and so forth can really come into play to help us do that, that 
smart uh, migration from one to the other or, over the years. I think that was all the questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Mike. I really had a couple of more topics to cover, but uh, Waco is also not there. We'll take it up in another uh, session. Uh, I want to touch base on blockchain, uh, the adaptability of it, um, because that is the right way to do it in utility. Uh, second is vehicles to grid, PTX. There are several nice topics which we can, I think we are kind of out of time. Probably we have one or two more minutes and uh, I can see Nitin already has joined. So, but it was really a pleasure, uh, uh, Mike, talking to you and then uh, Veko. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, moderating this uh, session. If there are any other questions to the audience, they can uh, feel free to send it to Nitin um, and then Arvind. We will get them uh, addressed. Absolutely. And I, I really enjoyed the opportunity today. And, and uh, please, if, if anybody online or whatever, I'm, I have my LinkedIn profile and so forth. So forth. Yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm extremely passionate about IT. If you haven't gathered, um, and technology, I think it. I think technology has to go from the basement into the boardroom, uh, and that's across the spectrum, across manufacturing. I, I think technology can take us to that next level. Um, we just have to trust it and we just have to apply it appropriately. So I, I thank you very much for the opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Datta, for you know moderating it extremely well. Mike for sharing the thoughts and Waiko for, you know, easy as to catch a flight, but did a fantastic job in making this panel discussion very interesting. So just to wrap up, we would like to thank our community partners, speakers, and attendees who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum. As rightly said, we had a great set of panel speakers who came together to share thoughts for today. Just for your information, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube page of our company. So all of you can go and see the recording anytime. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the same. Also, we would like to thank InfoVision, which is our knowledge and innovation partner. To understand more in depth, connect with them, and to suggest any aspect, all of you can go through their website, which is infovision.com, and closely liaison with them. Further, there are lots more in store for this year. As this year has just started. This is the first event for US market. We have next month's lot of events focusing on banking, financial insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, and obviously energy utility will keep on in the same pace. So request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Thanks and do take good care of yourself. Have a lovely day ahead. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.